G'day guys and welcome to Thirsty Monday, not Thirsty Thursday, it's Monday night tonight. My name is Justin May and this is the Shearer's Post and I hope you've all got your beer. I've got a beer tonight, I've been working hard scanning news over at Grenfell so I certainly need a beer after a big day in the field and a big day on the farm. So um, tonight we've got a, a very, very special guest. Uh, hi Colin, how are you mate? Thank you very much for, for joining us here on Thirsty Thursday. I'll just, for all those guys who are on now, I'll just um, give them a brief bio and introduction of yourself and the many, many things you've done um, in your farming career. So you've, um, you've had your own family, well, you're on a family farm and you're, it's been in the family since the 1860s. And that's a 2,000 acre property. And you run approximately 4,000 merino sheep and you sell the wool and um, excess lambs and live, uh, excess sheep off that farm. You fatten cattle in good seasons when it, when it allows. Uh, you have approximately 500 acres of cereal crop. You also have a Kelpie stud, which is um, uh, world famous. You send Kelpies all over the world. Um, you harvest native grasses, which is very unique. It sounds really awesome um, with what you do with native grasses, and I can't wait to hear more about that. Um, and some of the accolades that you have gotten um, as a public figure is um, you're an Australian Conservation Farmer of the Year in 2005, Australian Carbon Farmer of the Year in 2007, um, National Bob Hawk Land Care Award in 2014. That sounds a very prestigious award, that one. And in January 2015, the Australian newspaper, the Melbourne Weekly Times, suggested Colin was in the top six most influential farmers in the world. So welcome, Colin Sice, and thank you very much for joining us on our Thirsty Monday Q&A. And, um, and uh, I'll just let you say good day, mate. Uh, very g'day. good <laughs> hello, hello everyone. we've got we've already got a few guests on and if anybody wants to ask a question to, to colin we're going to field questions at the end colin will field questions at the end he's got a slideshow um that at the, at the moment that he's going to present to us all and um the slideshow however long it takes half an hour thereabouts after the slideshow there'll be there'll be a q a so we'll ask any question you would like to call in, in regards to what he does on his farm with his consultancy, with his kelpies, with harvesting native seed, um, anything that he's talking about. He's only too willing to have a chat to anybody about what he does and, of course, his passion for regenerative farming um, and the ecosystem on the farm. So take it away, Colin. The plough um, was developed about 8,000 years ago and then cattle or oxen domesticated and trained to pull the plough. Yep. Egyptians and later Romans fine-tuned the techniques which, which were adopted by Europeans and that's where modern ag agriculture came from. It came from Mesopotamia, then, then, then uh, Egyptians and Romans and then adopted uh, 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 in Europe and then. However, the plough and domestication of animals uh, has created deserts all all over the world. In other words, it's been a bloody disaster. That form of created uh, major problems all over this planet. So we need, really need to ask um, in the first place, did, did, did we get that, that, that form of agriculture wrong? And are there better ways to grow crops and graze animals? Um, and I'm, I'm going to suggest that, yes, and I'm also certainly going to suggest that, that uh, we need to get off the form of agriculture that is destroying our planet. So, um, were they wrong from the start? Were, 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 was the grazing wrong and the wrong, wrong from the start? So, just to sum all that up, for 10,000 years we've killed grasslands and destroyed soil to graze and graze animals. Now, moving on from that, you know, <laughs> but Agriculture uh, up until the, the 1950s was practiced without pest fertilizer, uh, or in, in Australia and in most other countries. Uh, now, 
some of you may know this, but I'm going to. It, it's it's certainly well worth talking about understanding what's gone wrong. But after the Second World War, they they were concerned about producing enough food. As we talk about now, because the populations of the world were increasing, and there was concern, genuine concern about producing enough food for the growing world population. So a new agricultural revolution was developed to solve the problems of feeding the, the, the growing numbers of people on the planet. It was labelled the Green Revolution. And it developed crops and fertiliser and pesticides to help those crops yield to their maximum. That, uh, that all had a lot of the, the, the products that were developed for, for, for the war were used in agriculture. Um, now, that Green Revolution was very successful. It, it did set out to produce huge amounts of food and, and achieve that. It did produce a large amount of food which, which reduced hunger and poverty. And interestingly, it created wealth for farmers. Now, that sounds like a great idea, and we should ask the question, what could possibly go wrong? And that was said at the time. And, and I sort of grew up on the tail end of that. My father adopted uh, on the property here a lot of the Green, green Revolution uh, stuff through the 1950s and 60s and 70s. Um, so the question, what could possibly go wrong? It's actually has created many problems. It's been a, an ecological disaster for our farms and the planet. Um, and that has created declining soil health, dependency on fertilizer, dependency on pesticides, reduction in food quality, which is often overlooked, and human health problems. Now, all of those problems there have been caused by the way that agriculture has been practiced. And, and one of the really interesting things now, which is very relevant to us farmers, is that wealth now is with multinational companies. It used to be with farmers when it first started, but the wealth for, uh, is with multinational companies now. If you are doubting that, this slide here really is, is an interesting one. And it's, it's actually Canadian. There's a fellow in Canadian, in Canada, in Canada uh, put this graph together, and I, I won't dwell on it too long, but it's from 1926 to 2016. And if you look at the, from 1926 to about 1980, somewhere around there, the farmer's share was, was okay. Agri, agribusness, or we're, we're, got, we're always making more, more profit, and this is profit we're talking about, uh, more profit than the farmers. But then from the 1980s on, farmers started to go broke and did have to go broke, and agribusiness made billions and billions of dollars while sending farmers broke. And uh, uh, and that's quite shocking when you Very look at that shocking. graph. So, Very shocking. Yep, it certainly is. And a lot of problem... Look, a lot of people, farmers that I talk to blame, almost blame themselves, well, they do blame themselves, that they can't, uh, they're not as profitable as their father and grandfathers were. But you look at that graph and you can see why. Um, it's not the farmer's fault. It's actually agribusiness that, that is, is, is destroying Definitely. farms uh, while they're making Definitely. huge profits. So we need to get, that's one reason, uh, there's plenty of reasons, but one reason we need to get off um, that form of agriculture. So, in other words, many of the things we do in agriculture make someone else wealthy, not farmers. Um, as you see from that graph, the multinational companies are the ones making the profit. So, not only is, it, is a, a, that form of agric agriculture uh, sending farmers broke, it, it has also created serious human health problems. And agriculture is actually supposed to be about food. There's something wrong. Um, now, now it is simply about making profit for multinational companies. Now, I've simplified this. Uh, all this information is available 
but I, I've just simplified all this. Um, there was some detailed work, and most of this work was done in England. And from 19, they looked at uh, um, mineral depletion in vegetables, wheat, and dairy in, in, from 1940, and then checked it again in 1991. Um, there's a little bit you can find about in the year about 2000, but it's not surprisingly uh, not easy to, uh, well, not as available. Um, but if we look at minerals in food, for, just in that period, have declined by, by 60 to 90 percent. Um, and you can actually get by oranges now that have no vitamin C in them at all. Um, and many of the, the much of the food that we, we eat ha have very little, uh, very few nutrients in them. Um, that's why a lot of us have to take vitamins. Yeah, well, I take day. a vitamin tablet every now, day, Colin. Yeah. I take about four or five of them to stay um, on top of my health, and we have yep. a quite a vibrant vegetable patch, and and um, quite often eat a lot of our own meat. Um, but still, yeah, to keep healthy, I'm always taking vitamins. Yeah, well, you, with your own vegetable patch you're good, uh, and your own meat, you're, you're probably okay, but most people don't have access to that. Um, now, the reason why, we need to, we really need to see the reason why we, we're getting major problems with our food, it, it's t directly related to a decline in soil health and soil carbon. In other words, poor quality food is caused by poor quality soil. And that form of, of agriculture, the green revolution stuff, industrial agriculture, what I'm talking about, is directly related to, is directly the cause of poor quality soils and poor quality food. So, high rates of fertiliser and pesticides have done serious damage to our farms and soil, and it has been an ecological disaster. Now, while I'm talking about ecology, um, all, virtually all of the problems in agriculture, that, that in the industrial agriculture, are not, actually not, ag, are not agricultural problems, they're ecological problems. All pest diseases, declining nutrients in soil, declining soil, are all actually ecological problems. No one, no one looks at, at it in, their, in, in an ecological way. Very few people, um, uh, it, it, uh, you, they will never fix the problems in agriculture by approaching it uh, the way they are. So, increasing won't fix our problems. The, the farm and soil ecosystem are stuffed. That's the problem. Um, so, we need to fix the ecosystems on our, on our farms and we need to fix the ecosystems on our planet too. Um, but how can we fix them? So, just looking at this, the way crops are growing using using plows and or excessive herbicide and pesticides kills grasslands, destroys the soil ecosystem and destroys the farm ecosystem. But also the way we graze animals simply isn't working either. It does the same thing. Uh, the way, uh, poor grazing management kills grassland destroy the, and destroys the soil ecosystem and the farm ecosystem. I'm going to address both those uh, 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 shortly. So, if we look at our farms, many paddocks and holtby have become unproductive, covered in weeds and hard compacted soils. And I get over many uh, uh, farms in Australia and, and in other countries as well. And a lot of the farms I go on to are, are exactly that hard compacted soils full of weeds and, and totally un I'm quite shocked at times at, at, at uh, uh, the, the, the owners of those properties, how they can make a profit or any money at all off them because they're that degraded. Um, but most people don't realise that they are as degraded as they are. Well, if, if, I, if I can, Colin, uh, how I, do we like, fix that? part of my family, um, well, nearly all of my um, uncles, um, that they all farm and they keep on telling me that they the farm doesn't produce what it used to produce when they were children so that's sort of 50, 60 years ago now it was very, very productive back then and they just keep on adding the inputs and it's still not as productive with, with the inputs now um, 
albeit they're, they're quite old-fashioned farmers and don't want to spend too much money, but they do put inputs into it and it's not as it was when they were kids. I remember like the stocking capacity that dad used to talk about um, with my grandfather um, was way more than it is now and the crops that they used to produce with very minimal inputs. That's exactly, yes, yes. And then we're told to put more fertilizer in to fix the problems, which is not the answer. Uh, the opposite needs to ask that. Uh, 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 towards the end of this this talk, and the the, the a part of the re reason or the uh, our our farms are in such poor states is that we've isolated ourselves from nature, and our farms soil and animals should be nurtured. Um, they're not nurtured anymore. How can you nurture them when you when you're killing everything with, with a pesticide, and um, not anti. Uh, any inputs that's not where I'm coming from but but uh, we've been using those inputs in the wrong wrong way and and far too much so we fix our, our, our soil pasture and soil nutrient decline crop disease uh, and and a while we've, we've been productive and profitable now we need to be able to also do that without uh, without spending excessive amounts of money because <laughs> that's what we've done in the past. This this isn't about spending uh, vast amounts of money. Um, in fact, it's about spending very little money. And, um, I haven't got in this talk tonight, but uh, the reason I changed was that um, uh, we got burnt out in a major bushfire in 1979 and I had to uh, survive without any money at all. And I developed a lot of the stuff that I that I developed because uh, uh, we were totally broke after that after that serious fire. Um, we lost three thousand sheep in the fire, um, all the buildings and all the fences. So we had to start from scratch. So that's where a lot of the stuff I speak about. It's has funny, come you from. know, a lot of adversity um, does bring look, change. And I think back on my life, the, the adversity yeah. that I've had in life always brings about about a change a, and a positive change if you go look for it it might seem devastating at the time which it always does and i can't imagine what a bushfire would have been like for you guys to have gone through it and a lot of people who might be listening in tonight can probably um say that they've been through similar things because there's a lot of bushfires in australia but it's um certainly those adversities if you take the right attitude coming out of them um, and you you, you, don't, you you do what you've done and take a positive outlook and say, well, I'm broke here. What can I do to actually salvage what I've got and then move on to make a profit for my family? So that's something to be commended, commendable because it takes a lot of spirit to be able to do that. And, um, and uh, yeah, continue on with that, mate. Yeah, it's been an interesting journey. And... and um... The best thing that actually happened to me was that fire, oh. but um, <laughs> but over time, it, yeah, because it it, uh, it forced me to develop the stuff that I did, because there was nothing there. I had to develop all the stuff that I developed from scratch, um, and no one believed me anyway. So, but anyway, I'll move on. Um, so, we need to start by fixing our soil. But this can only be done by growing more plants. Uh, the advice that we get now to fix our soil is to put fertilizer on it. Uh, plants are the drivers of, of, of our soil. Um, plants are the drivers of everything. So growing more plants. Uh, and that's not necessarily managing our, our properties in ways where we can um, encourage the growth of plants um, and, and then get them to grow to their optimum. Uh, and, and especially that, that uh, how what we do eventually. You know, it's funny, um, Colin, you, you talk about your, your plants growing optimally and I, I don't know whether you're going to allude to this um, in, in an upcoming um, slide that you've got, but in and around the shearing shed that we've got, um, where we where we keep sheep for a short period of time in a, in a tight area, say about three, four, five hundred um, ewes and their lambs in a in a very tight area for a few days before they go in to be shorn, 
that's the first place to come away um, really quickly and we leave it for probably four, five, six months before we bring them back through those sets of yards to do something again in either the shearing shed or the sheep yards. It's, that's, that's the most fertile yeah. place on our property is the holding paddock going into the sheep yards. Yep, yep, and that's how we need to talk about in a minute. But yeah, that that's exactly right. But an intensive graze and then very long long uh, recovery periods or rest periods um, is is way to way to do it. Um, the fact a, a paddock at home here, it's that's all, all native grasses in there. Uh, that particular paddock and, and that's just Beautiful. very typical of the whole property. Oh, just that, but that one there um, is also native. That thing in front that looks a bit like Lucerne there is actually a native glycine or, or native legume. Oh, yeah. Um, to cover our soil and farms with a diverse range of living plants, and diversity is the real key to it. Um, and and um, um, the best way to do this is primary grazing uh, is, to, is to get our grazing right. There are other ways of doing it, which I'm going to touch on, but, but key to it. So, the plants will restore our farms so on profit plants, and that, that's the key to it. Um, we need or a pasture that functions like grassland. It's the key. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be native, but not native plants at all but we need diversity in there and native grasslands are extremely good because they have great diversity and our grasslands or, or in, in Australia had about 300 species in them um, when um, the early explorers but when, uh, when the early explorers uh, um, and the early settled um, we can do it with by, by changing our crop growing methods which I will talk about and growing multi um, there's a few different ways of doing this um, and these these are methods that are uh, and, and developed here so the way to do this is well this is just what I just said change the grazing management and if if you're growing crops change the cropping methods it's a bit on grazing and obviously, I, I, I'm not going to talk a lot about grazing. Probably get, give you enough information tonight to be dangerous to yourself, I would imagine. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> yeah, well, it's uh, that. That's why, like, this is very informative, and I'm sure it is to a lot of guys. Whereas they, we can start to follow up on some of the information you've got to offer here now. So this is a like a, a bite snippet of what of what is or what can be done on your farm as far as regenerating it and get it, getting it going. Yes, yeah. A good grazing, I'm talking about grazing management here. I'm not, uh, uh, good grazing management, um, and I'm, I'm getting there. We can increase the germination of perennial pasture species um, that from seed that's already in um, now we don't necessarily have to sow uh, 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 pastures like we can, we have to sow pastures and you can, but often we, we've got enough seed in our soil that we can stimulate the germination of that seed that's in the soil at very, very, very low cost. Obviously, no, that is probably the first thing that we should be trying to do. Um, the type of grazing I talk, talk about is holistic grazing. Grazing rotation, um, and, and that type of grazing encourages perennial uh, perennial species to germinate um, and discourages the growth of annual weeds, uh, and 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 that's a big one. Like um, if you get it right, you'll get, start to get more and more perennial species and less 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 and less annual weeds. Now, the um, the fellow that developed this, uh, well, we'll just backtrack a bit. It, this type of grazing isn't new. A lot of people think it's, it's new, but it is interesting. 
one of the very early pioneers of, of this was a French scientist called Andre Voisin. And um, Alan, but Alan Savory, who was uh, Rhodesian actually uh, uh, in Africa, so he he developed uh, ballistic man grazing in the 1960s, uh, and, and a lot of the grazing we're doing now comes from that. And what Alan did was observe the the large mobs of animals in Africa uh, about how they moved uh, through the landscape and and returned about six months later and how, how healthy the grasslands were, were in Africa. And it was because the animals were grazing them and grazing, at, but, but they didn't need to be grazed, but they had a long recovery period. Um, so the plants recovered before they were grazed again. So what's wrong with the way we graze? So allowing animals to graze as they wish, in other words, set stop grazing, does create many problems. Um, so we need to look at what kills plants because we get told um, all the time that we need, after a while, pastures will decline. We get told this and then we need to re them again. Well, that's garbage. That's, uh, um, if they're perennial species, uh, we should be able to, to manage them well and reinvigorate them with animals. So what the problem is with, with climate declining pasture is not giving the perennial plants enough time to recover from the grazing before they're regrazed. Um, that, that's what kills plants. It's not the animals the prob that is the problem. It's a human managing the animal that's the problem. There's nothing wrong with animals grazing, uh, grazing uh, grasslands or pastures. Um, uh, grasslands have evolved. Our Australian grasslands are 50 million years old, managed by uh, grazing animals, really. And all, all uh, the grasslands around the world uh, were grazed. So inappropriate grazing management kills perennial it, it does in, encourage uh, um, annual weed species and it, it interestingly it plant it creates plants with short roots um and that is i don't i think i may have taken up the next slide but I'll, I'll explain that in a minute um now that type of grazing or set stock grazing creates uh, Soil compaction issues, stops water infiltration, prevents soil nutrient cycling and destroys the soil ecosystem. And that is what's wrong with most farms that I go on to. Um, now, I'll just add plants with short roots. Um, plants are almost a mirror image of, of, of what, what's on top and what's underneath. Uh, in other words, if you have a, 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 a tall, uh, a big, tall, healthy grass plant. The roots will be, be and or at least mass to the to the, the leaves themselves. However, if they're kept short, short all the root system, um, and that that's what's wrong with with uh, con part of what's wrong with with continuous grazing. There's just some photos that one here, um, and. Um, even though it's black and white, you can see it's very short a pasture, probably just, oh, it would be native in that era, uh, but with grey is extremely short. Um, but now uh, uh, the property here is grazed with mobs of about 2,000 um, in one mob and and rotated around the property. And, um, and with about... Colin. Sorry. With yep. um, regards to the, like you, you've obviously got 2001 mob. Does um, that type of grazing, is that sort of uh, for big mobs alone or can, can somebody with a small mob of sheep or cattle or, or their livestock, can they graze this way yep. like you graze? Yeah, absolutely. You can do it with 10 sheep or five or six or 10 cat head of cattle. Um, uh, what you do in that instance is, is that the area that they're, they're, they've given access to needs to be smaller. Um, and, and if you haven't got a, a small addicts, uh, they just they need to stay there longer to recover to, in that graze period uh, and then um, the long rest period. 
Um, but pro basically, if you've only got a little lot, uh, you, you, you have small paddocks. And a lot of people do that with electric fencing, especially with cattle. Um, so, yeah, you just make the paddock smaller if you've got smaller mobs. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, if you've only got five or ten sheep, you could cut them up in quarter acre blocks or even like whatever size yeah. you, you yeah. needed to rotate around the farm. That's right here on, on, on the property here. Yep. Um, which is planning to get, get a rotation with recovery. You don't necessarily need that many, but you, you, you sort of need uh, to get a, a reasonable rotation. And is that like uh, a three, would you have them on there for three days or five days or one week? How long would you have them yeah, on each gen paddock? Generally from two to five days. Yep. It does vary a lot depending on the season. Um, it, uh, because the time that they spend in that paddy, um, multiplied by 70 paddocks or 20 paddocks, whatever, whatever paddocks you've got, is it, it creates the, the, the time for the rest period. Yeah. Um, if you've got 10 paddocks and, and they're only in there for two days, well, that, that, that's only 20 days before they're back again. Um, so, and it can be worked out mathematically quite, quite accurately. And as part of your what you do uh -huh. with your consultancy, made would if you were doing a consultant to a to a uh, like a, a, a farm, no matter what size it was, um, that's something yeah. that you could sort of guide them in saying, right, you've got X amount of acres or hectares, you got so many head of livestock. Yeah, we need to get these livestock into a certain a certain acreage size or hectare size, and rotate them um, in a time period around the, the, the farm, no matter how big the farm is, that's something that you could guide a person in doing? Yeah. It can be a very small farm, probably 20, 30 acres, or it can be 20,000 acres. Yeah. Um, that doesn't matter too much. Uh, it, 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 yeah. It, uh, but I do a lot of that, that type of work and also do that sort of stuff for people if they want it yeah, around that. Um, I, I thought, didn't think I had this photo here, but but that demonstrates um, those three. That the, the photos I have, they're the, they're the same plant, um, Christine Jones, a fair while ago, and demonstrate the big plant there. Showed, so it's got a big leaf. The poor little plant on the left hand side, because it's been grazed really short, short root system. So if you think about that poor little one there how much water can that one sort of access virtually done and, and and how much nutrient can it can it can it get access so it, 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 it's uh, and that that is, it will demonstrate it does. that's very really, really vivid, well a very vivid um, clear about, picture of what a root system um does for above the soil and what it actually looks like below the soil it's the nearly equivalent of below is what it is above that's right. It's almost a mirror image. Yeah, yeah. Up top, so it's a very good reason why why you grow plants uh, uh, bigger. Let, let the leaf as much leaf area as you can, because it's not just the leaf; it's the roots as well that that, that is, uh, is growing as well as the leaves. So yeah. very important, especially for restoring and soil. Um, so if we let that, the plants recover from grazing and, get, and grow bigger, they just from what I've got written here, they do produce a lot of litter, which cover. We need we need a lot of uh, we we need to produce ground cover. We should not have bare ground. Um, you'll always have bare ground if the plant is on, on the left. Um, so they have big root systems. They can access water and nutrients. They can cycle nutrients. And those the plants that have, that have big root systems, yep. and yep. obviously they use more stock feed. So everyone, and, and I'm going to get on to this towards the end of this talk. Two root systems support a diverse range of soil microbes as well. Yep. So, um, so better grazing measures can restore grassland and pasture. Um, that's Chester, there's probably about five. They use with their, their lambs on them. There, there'd be 
probably 4,000 sheep in that mob. And we, we're just uh, moving them through a gate there and, and going to win those lambs. So um, it can be uh, big, or, big or, or, or small. Yeah, yeah, that's good to know. Touch a little bit on on growing crop stock food and growing quicker, because I, I I think most of your uh, uh, people are, uh, are most likely not growing crops, but uh, I'll just I'll just go through it quickly. So, what's wrong with the way crops are growing? But and also this addresses a lot of the problems. Some of the farms that we have now have, have had crops grown on them in the past. If it's a water farm. Um, and, and the reason why uh, our, these farms aren't as productive as they and profitable as they should be, it, it, it will be addressed here because they've been cropping previously. So uh, planting soil for the last 150 years has been a major cause of, uh, of destroying and degraded soil. And the way crops are growing now, uh, they've simply replaced the plough with a boom spray and pesticide. Um, is that, that nothing's really changed. The, the basic philosophy on farming, on growing crops or farming is the same. So around the world, the way crops are grown reduce carbon levels, uh, which makes ineffective use of rainfall redu and reduces soil fertility, which means more fertilizer needs to be insect attack, means more insecticide and more crop disease is more fungus. A little bit on pasture cropping here, which is what I developed. Uh, uh, and pasture cropping is, is, is about growing a crop into dormant perennial grassland without killing the grassland. Um, and, and what I'm doing here is, uh, is just zero tilling, not ploughing uh, straight into that, into that grassland when it's in its dormant stage. Um, and um, these, this method now has been adopted all over the world uh, and, and, um, and, and uh, 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 in many countries now. There's probably over a million acres that are pasture crop now around the world. Um, I, I've developed a different form of, of this as well, which is multi-species pasture cropping, which is, which is instead of planting one species, we're putting up to six or ten species into a crop, which is, is extremely good quality stock feed. Um, I, we've got some data of not a, a, a trial we did last year here on um, merino lambs and the weights doubled on the multi-species crop compared to a single species crop. Yeah, that's yeah, really very good. Yeah. 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 So that's just a... Um, a, 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 a um, but these multi-species crop, like, um, a lot of people in transitioning, when they're transitioning, their properties are original and, and, and hard compacted. Um, we can use a diverse range of fast growing annuals to um, restore the farm or restore, restore the soil very rapidly. Um, and, and it does, um, it increases soil carbon nutrient cycling and, and it does so um, how do we do this how do we fix our, our, our farms and ecosystems uh, and by growing plants plants and more plants which is where I started from in the first place um, by growing plants and as I said there the best way to start is by getting our grazing better, um, creating plant recovery time, uh, and then that will start, you'll start to get more and more plants naturally. But I'm going to just talk, to sum this up, how does the change in grazing management and the way, uh, the way crops are growing improve our farms? Because it certainly will, and I haven't got any data in on in this talk on my property, um, but now I I uh, save eighty thousand dollars a year, money that I don't spend now on fertilizer and pesticides, and and I I did that uh, by 
with the methods I've just spoken about there just quickly. Um, the farm just gets better and better and it is far more profitable than it ever was, um, or at least for 100 years anyway. We need to remember that farms and soils should function as if that's the key to this. Changing grazing management, larger plants with bigger roots, growing a diverse multi-species crop can reduce the pasture cropping I spoke about to stimulate the germination of perennial pasture species. So now, how do plants, because remember, I'm talking about just growing plants, not putting fertilizer and pesticides on. However, I'm not anti uh, uh, transitioning into this. Uh, it, 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 and that's part of what I do too, is, is getting the transition from where they are to this form of... Uh, when I do that, I don't get take people straight off, off fertilizer and pesticides. I, I do that. that gradually and i always recommend people to just wean off those things gradually yeah it could be a disaster if they went straight off um fertilizer yep. after being on it for a number of decades and then all of a sudden stop you'd nearly end up with a moonscape that's exactly right it's it, it's uh it's it's setting yourself up to, to fail. You don't people to fail uh, with this when when people People, if they're starting wanting to transition to another method of agriculture, yeah. needs to be done carefully. This is really the, the key to a lot to all of this. Remember, soil is a living, breathing subaquatic ecosystem. And people are probably wondering now what's that strange looking creature in the middle there. It's actually a water bear. That's not there, obviously, but it's a microscopic little creature. <laughs> but it does demonstrate that our soils are alive. <laughs> um, they're almost indestructible, those things, uh, uh, those water bears. It, um, anyway. It looks incredible, doesn't it? It's a whole, that's under the microscope, obviously. That's under a microscope. When, when I was in the US about three years ago, Gabe Brown, who, who many of you may, know, may have heard of, Gabe's a yeah, good friend of mine. Yeah, and Gabe. He had that flat slide, actually, on, on his talk, and I said to I said, Gabe, geez, can I have that slide? And he said, yeah, so he, he gave it to me. Um, so, um, because it really illustrates the point very well. Um, microbes, soil microbes, and the, all the all those bugs there, that, 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 that fellow swimming around there, they require plants for food feed red exudates and decaying plant organic matter to soil microbes. And they do that through photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is, is, is the plants using sunlight as the energy source, um, uh, and basically water and, and, and water and carbon dioxide um, to produce simple sugars. Now, those simple sugars are used to grow, grow leaves. What is often not known is that about half of those simple sugars or red ex or exudates how can soil that feed soil microbes which is fascinating um, in return microbes supply nutrients to plants now um, it, it, which if the plant is giving away virtually half of its energy it, it has to have a good reason for it for it so um, uh, Soil microbes feed off those sugars. They supply, especially things like fungi, some of the thing, fungi like mycorrhizal fungi, supplies uh, uh, sugars and nutrients. Uh, sorry, nutrients uh, uh, back to back to the plant. In any slide here, which is really interesting, that amazing bit of the film. That is actually a, a, under a microscope pumping sugars in, out into the soil. Um, and all around that, that, that microbes feed off that, which is really quite fascinating. <coughs> now, uh, soil microbial diversity. We need we we need a a, um, a, a, a great diversity of, of microbes in the soil to be able to to get our soil healthy and functioning and functioning as a whole ecosystem. We need great, 
great diversity of soil of, of, of microbes. <coughs> now, soil microbe diversity is species diversity. So, if we had 200 or 300 plants in in a grassland like we had originally, the the diversity of of, of microbes is is enormous. It's huge, and that's why our grasslands were exceptionally good around the world, and that's why our soils were, were good. A lot of misconceptions about our soil in Australia. Our soils in Australia weren't poor. They might be geologically ancient, but we, the grassland soils were extremely fertile, um, but we soon destroyed those, those soils. Um, and they were driven by a huge range of plants feeding a huge range of soil microbes. Um, and, and that really is the key on to how we fix our farms, get some feeding microbes. Uh, a, diverse, a, a diverse and vast range of soil microbes stimulate plant growth, plant health, create tolerance to drought and plant disease suppression. It does all of that and a, a, a name for that is actually quorum sensing, which I, I really didn't I have in this. I took it out of this talk. I didn't want to make it any more complicated than it needed to be. So. Yeah, so how do we restore our farms? Change the way we graze our animals. Uh, we don't need tons of fertiliser to, to, to restore our farms. In fact, um, which I haven't touched on, fertiliser and pesticides actually kill soil microbes, kills the things that we actually are, are, that are actually going to destroy them. That's another one. Uh, the products we put on are dam very damaging soil microbes. They make they'll make plants grow better, but they but at the expense of my of microbes. So, grow plants lands, um, and grow multi-species crops. Or better than that, do all of it. The more things we can put together, like um, there's some really good things. Uh, good permaculture principles are extremely good. Organics, uh, organic uh, um, uh, methods are really good. Ploughing soil isn't good, but uh, some are good. Peter Andrews' work with rivers is, is good. There's, there's a there's a lot of good good uh, things out there that we can we can use to to, to restore yeah, our, sure. our properties. Not just the, not just the things I, I have used. Um, all that up, plants to restore our farms and soil and profit. Uh, that's it. I've got another little. Side, if people are interested, there is a pasture cropping course, which is, if people are interested, which is more than pasture cropping, it talks about grazing and all sorts of things as well. So, okay. All right, mate. Well, that's a, that was an awesome little presentation. Thanks very much for that. We haven't got any questions other than um, just we had a bit of echoing right at the beginning, but we've sorted all that out. Um, but, yeah, look, I've... I've probably got a few things that I'd like to ask you um, just myself. If there's yeah. anyone else out there who wants to ask Colin a question, please feel free to um, just type into the chat box and, and I'll relay those questions on to, to Colin. So, um, yeah, we were having a chat today in and around what I was doing with my contracting work um, out around Grenfell and um, very traditional farm out there, like high input, and they do grow a lot of crops. Um, and uh, they would, like the chap was saying, he's a really good farmer, really good, really, really good conventional farmer. Cares a lot about his livestock, has fantastic livestock, fantastic crops. But he, he said to me, what you, what the sheep take out, um, how, do, how does this type of agriculture put back in? And that, that was, um, he was sort of saying, well, it can't work because there's not you're not putting the inputs back in you're not putting the superphosphate and the nitrogen and the calcium back in because the sheep strip it out by eating it and they're only pulling back and weighing back a little bit of it so what do you what do you say to something like to a, to a traditional farmer like that yep um that's um that's been tossed around now for a long time and it's basically designed to sell fertilizer yep. um and and un until we understood the 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 um, interrelation 
planted are a um, combination, I guess, of, of plants and soil microbes, we, we, we can't, couldn't have understood it. Um, a lot of that is, uh, is, is relevant. Uh, and there's a couple of things right, to address that. I'll just backtrack a bit. Um, when this, the, at, at the start of this planet, this planet was a great big ball of rock. That's all, all that there, there was here. Now, over, over billions of years, bacteria, fungi, wild microbes evolved. Um, and the growing of plants and the combination of microbes actually built soil from, from this big ball of rock. Um, so it's plants that built soil in the first place in combination with microbes. Now, now where I'm getting at, all the minerals that are in our soil today were, were on this planet four and a half billion years ago. Um, so it's the growing of plants uh, and, 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 my, and we commonly released uh, minerals uh, and nutrients from that pyramid. <coughs> from that, uh, that. And, and um, um, that's where all our minerals nitrogen can, does come, come from at the atmospheric nitrogen. But um, so they were all here. They haven't. All those minerals haven't gone anywhere. Um, people think they go somewhere, but they haven't. They cycle. Now that now, makes sense. What was here at the beginning is is here now. That's right. Now, the property here, my property, Winona, is is the most researched property in Australia, and that's happened because um, when I was developing a lot of this stuff. <laughs> I, I, I could see all these changes happening, um, you know, better plant growth, improved soil and softer soil, all this stuff, and things were just, it just seemed, seemed to be just working. And the question I said to myself, I need to collect some data. <laughs> and, I, and I started doing that in the mid-90s, collecting data, but I encouraged CSIRO to come here, Sydney University, Melbourne and Canberra Uni. Uh, and and, and um, so... We have all this data collected on the place here. Now, one thing that's really interesting is that the nutrients on this property. Now, we're not talk, we're talking about all the we tested the soil. Dr. Christine Jones and I just tested the soil down to two feet, sixty centimetres increments, um, and um, uh, on a na neighbouring place at and. and and on, on mine, an, an adjoining property, straight through the fence. Anyway, what we found that was that all of the nutrients had increased by 160%, 163%. And not just phosphorus and, and, and nitrogen, all the trace elements now, everything had increased, um, not decreased. So the question you get asked, where did it have to come from somewhere? Yeah. One thing that's happening is that the plants now are so much bigger and with great big root system, we find plant roots down to a meter cause and even dig post holes. Um, so, um, so they're cycling nutrients from deeper in the soil, but also because our soils are functioning as an ecosystem now, Uh, a lot of nutrients are still being released from the pit that's still in the soil, where, where the same place it came from four and a half million years, billion years ago. Um, so that's the answer to to uh, their question about that. But we have not only here uh, on the, the property here, uh, Tim Wright up in uh, is he, he is in uh, up in New England. Tim was one of the very first people to adopt um, holistic grazing management. And his place has been monitored as well. And he got the same type of result. The, um, uh, all the nutrients on his farm have increased as well. Um, so it's not just my, yeah. my property. Yeah. So it, it, we don't necessarily need, need great each fertiliser. Well, that, that, that makes sense to a... To a guy who's putting in, or to a lot of farmers who's putting in a lot of inputs, that it, um, 
it, yeah. it it may not make a lot of sense because they've just been brought up in the modern agricultural industry. But um, I can certainly see how it, it, yeah. it makes makes sense that um, using this type of regenerative agriculture, holistic grazing, pasture cropping, um, cover crops, you're just adding more nutrient into the soil by growing plants. That's right, yes. A small amount of fertiliser on uh, as, as, as well. <coughs> There's nothing wrong with that. But we shouldn't be putting the huge amounts of fertiliser on that we have in the past. That's ridiculous. Um, and, and now there are organic fertilisers uh, uh, available for use, chemical fertilisers as well. But yeah. And that's, that's to be used in that transition stage. So, for example, I haven't put fertilizer super phosphate on, on the property here for 40 years, since, since 1979. It's more than 40 years. Um, not, nothing, no no fertiliser, uh, no, no super phosphate on here for that time, and yet the phosphorus levels keep increasing. Well, that uh, proof's in the pudding, and the, the um, proof's in the data. I did, I did, well, yeah, that's right. I do put a little tiny bit of fertiliser on uh, under crops, but, uh, very little. Certainly, certainly, um, yeah, certainly a, 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 a minuscule amount yeah. uh, for, for what's normally recommended. Uh, there's been no pesticide used here for uh, 20, 30 years. Yeah. No, 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 no fungicides or insecticides as well. It must um, be, and, Colin, yeah. it must be a, um, doing this sort of farming, like um, it must give you a great deal of satisfaction you not only like i know farming for most people is very satisfying and they love the land and they feel a great connection to the land and australia's got a great history with with the aboriginal yeah. people indigenous people that like having that connection initially and i think australian farmers have probably not the connection that, that the indigenous do but they have a real connection to the land um uh, especially with their with their own farming land and to see what you've done with uh, with with your land by decreasing the the inputs into it and actually seeing the increase in productivity and seeing the health of your livestock, um, seeing the health of your yeah. your land, seeing the biodiversity, seeing the natural grasses. I don't know how many natural grasses you've got growing, native grasses you've got growing on your place there now, but you must have um, scores of them. So, uh, but to see all that, yeah. to see all of that yeah. coming yeah. and. And uh, and and then be a part of it and watching it flourish, it must be it yeah. must be a joyful thing for you to to do that and then and then to show other people, um, the benefits of doing it as well. It it would be a it'd be an amazing journey that you've been on and an amazing life to see the transformation in 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 the land that yeah. adopts this practice. That that's right. Yes. Oh, you yeah, know, it's been it's very rewarding uh, doing it. Uh, um, and and um. So, and it's created a lot of interest around the world. And for example, um, only next week, late next week, uh, there's, there's a French, French film crew coming here, to a documentary, a television documentary. Awesome. Yeah. Um, they must be in quarantine now, I think. I don't know where they are. Probably in Darwin. They probably are. <laughs> um, They're an essential service, obviously. Ah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, there's a lot of interest in it. Um, and I, I actually, uh, I, I wrote a book uh, a few years ago. It was slowed, the production of it was slowed down with the virus, but it's going to be released in that story and, and, uh, and a little sort of what I spoke about tonight, but in more detail. Um, uh, and that book will be, be out this year. So what book was that, so, Colin, say again, yeah. mate? Oh, my book, a uh, book that I wrote, um, it, well, I, I'm still thinking, I'm trying to work out the name, but um, I was going to call it Regeneration to start with, but I think I'll call it Out of the Ashes, um, which, which which is an indication of, of all that, uh, how I changed uh, after the fire in 1979. Yeah. But, um, but it covers my whole history from, from convict days with it. My ancestors came out on, on the ship uh, in, in 1798, um, right, what we did on the land and, and 
and each generation about what they did and mostly did things wrong and, and what I did too and did things wrong and then, and then and how I said about restoring it. That would, yeah, that would be an awesome about. read. When it comes out, um, we ought to do a bit of a plug, mate, and get together and... and um, and promote it because that would be something I'd, in particular I'd love to read, and I know a lot of um, people on the on the Shearer's Post. I think they'd be very interested in reading reading that book as well. It's um, so, uh, see yeah. as I was, I've been following you now for a number of years, both on um, online and and uh, had you come around our our, our little lease farm there uh, five or six years ago and, and advise us um, on holistic grazing in particular, which really helped us through the drought. So, all right, mate, we might pull it up there for the night. It's um, been fantastic having a chat to you. So um, uh, I think everybody who, we've had a fair few um, bob in and out tonight. It's, it's gone, the, um, the Q&A has gone for um, around about an hour and uh, 20 minutes. So it's been a good long time, but we've got, there's so much information that you've got um uh, within you and it's, it's it's a great thing to to get it out and about and uh to see if anybody out there would be interested in regenerative farming we're going to have um colin's link um uh in our private facebook page and um uh to where you if you're interested in getting some consultancy work done from colin um maybe having a look at his um his website he sells a lot of um world renowned for the kelpie pups too that which we didn't get to have a chat about tonight maybe we'll do that do it another time mate but um it'd be certainly yeah that's i, I know i've seen you at the australian national field days at orange um several times with you in the past i don't know if you still go to that or not whenever it's on um but you've been there with your dogs haven't you yeah, we do that. Um, my son does most of that now. He takes the dogs up here you know, in Orange and also in Mudgy, the Mudgy Field of those signs. Yeah. I, I'm actually talking, uh, giving a talk at the Mudgy Field of those in there. Uh, they do they do talks during the uh, not on the dogs, but on, um, on the type of things I was talking about tonight, I guess. Awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. I'll be doing the same on grazing management and also the, the work on that um uh, our trials we did on the grazing uh i'll be talking mostly about i think that that yeah. the field days they do that no oh, well that'll be good if you're in and around mudge um, if you're going to the mudgy small farm field days in july i think it's the first week in july first or second week in july mudgy is on well colin's going to be there so and uh doing a few talks at the, the mudgy small farm field day and they'll have their dogs over at the australian national field days god willing the um, the field days will be on this year and we won't have any virus to contend with. So anyway, Colin, thank you, mate. Much appreciated for coming on and, and um, sharing your knowledge with us. And when that book comes out, um, I can't wait to get a copy of it and and uh, delve into it, especially in the history of Australian agriculture and and uh, what the country was like uh, pre-European or, or just after European settlement. It must have been an amazing place to open up and to have a look at if you were some of the first white men um coming into into australia and seeing it and um for certainly it would have been a spectacular place it's just spectacular place now but um yeah certainly back then with all the grasses and native grasses would have been awesome and it'd be a great read i'm sure all right mate well if you stay on the line thanks very much uh to to everybody else um i'll endeavor to do a thirsty thursday this week i will be in beechworth in victoria and we'll be talking um, to a to a chap down there, Russ Davis, and we'll be, we're going to be talking about um, sheep fertility, melatonin, melatonin, um, natural um, uh, sheep hormone to get them cycling. Um, and I think that'll be a really worthwhile Thirsty Thursday. Um, Russ has got a heap of heap to offer from um, Siva Animal Health, and we'll be talking to him this thurs this Thursday Thursday at seven thirty. I'll be down at Beechworth in Victoria. All right, guys, I'll look forward to seeing you then. In the meantime, thank you, Colin, and thank you to everybody else. I've really enjoyed my beer tonight, Thirsty Monday, uh, talking to Colin, and um, there's a lot of problems that can be solved drinking a beer. Thanks, mate.